morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is Carlo Pietrobelli. We are calling from uh, the UNESCO chair at the United Nations University, uh, UNU Merit in Maastricht. And today we have the privilege of having uh, two great speakers to uh, address an issue that is becoming more and more relevant for uh, for the world, for, I would say, uh, not only developing countries, but also advanced countries. And this is automation and technological change that is leading to, to automation. Um, uh, and we have uh, two speakers. We have uh, uh, Professor Pascual Restrepo, who is uh, an assistant professor of economics at Boston University. Uh, since uh, uh, 2017 and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And, and Pascual has been uh, uh, publishing a lot of very influential research on the impact of technology on inequality, on labor markets, on economic growth, uh, especially focusing on the issue of uh, automation technology. Uh, welcome, Pascual. And, and as soon as uh, Pascual presents uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, research results, we're going to have uh, uh, Professor Maria Savona, who's another great expert on, on technology and change, uh, technological change and innovation. She's a professor of applied economics at the Department of Economics uh, at Lewis uh, University in Rome, and also a professor of economics of innovation at SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex in the UK. And, and she's been publishing widely on, on, on various issues related to the economics of innovation, employment, wage inequality, and technological change, and so on. So really a great uh, uh, lineup today. Uh, I think I can give the floor to, to Pascual Restrepo and first uh, listen from him what he has to, uh, what he wants to share with us and with the audience that we have today. Pascual, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Carlo, for, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Just a second. Okay. Uh, let, let me let just me confirm. Say, let me say one word to the audience. Uh, I know there's several people on, on YouTube following. Uh, you can use the chat option and ask questions to our invited speakers. So please, uh, you will not be able to, to, to speak online live, but you can uh, use the chat and uh, uh, pose your questions to our speakers. Thank you. Perfect. So let me just confirm that you're seeing my slides. Yes, yes. Okay, Perfect. great, great. So thanks so much to, to the organizers for, for inviting me to present at this event. I'm very excited to share my work and also to listen to, to Maria and her discussion and also to comments and questions by, by the audience. And so today I'm going to do a presentation that is mostly based on work that I've done with Darona Semoglu. And what I want to do is to provide an overview of our research agenda. And then in the last five, seven minutes of my presentation, I want to spend some time discussing what are the potential implications of some of these automation technologies for Latin America, but also for developing countries uh, more generally. And so let me start by giving you like a broader overview of our agenda. In a nutshell, uh, our research studies the economic and social forces driving the current wave of automation technologies and the distributional and aggregate implications of these technologies. And so let me begin by being very precise and trying to define what we mean by automation technologies. So we can think of production as a process that requires completing many different tasks. Think, for example, of producing a car. You first have to design the car, then you have to purchase different parts, you have to assemble the parts together, weld them, paint them, code them, and so on. And then finally, you need to sell and distribute the car. Now, each of these tasks must be allocated to workers with different skills, though increasingly, technological progress has also made it possible to complete a widening range of tasks using new types of capital such as industrial robots, specialized software, or even dedicated machinery. So I'm going to refer in this presentation to this process where an increasing range of tasks is relocated from labor and starts being produced with capital as automation. 
Now, the first observation that I want to make is that automation is not a new phenomenon. So in the 1700s, we had the adoption of weaving and spinning machines that substituted for skilled artisans in England. Later in agriculture, we also saw the use of mechanical reapers and harvesters that replaced manual labor working with sides and other rudimentary and manual tools. And at least since the early 80s, we've experienced a new wave of automation technologies. So for example, in manufacturing, many production tasks that used to be quite labor intensive, such as welding or the assembling of cars, have now been automated and are being performed in a fully automated way by industrial robots, dedicated equipment. And these are tools that are now being powered by software and not by workers. In other sectors of the economy, enterprise software has allowed firms to automate their sales, their back office jobs, and their data keeping processes, which were previously performed by white collar workers employed in clerical jobs. And there's a sense in which this might actually continue into the future with AI, which holds the promise of being capable to automate many non routine tasks, such as trading, driving of trucks, medical diagnosing and even teaching, perhaps. So as these examples show, the defining feature of automation is that it displaces workers from some of the tasks that they used to perform. And this is going to generate an important displacement effect. And as a result, the participation of those workers that are getting displaced in the production process is going to be reduced. And this is going to have important implications for their wages and also for their employment opportunities. In a way, we can think that they're going to be left with fewer uses for their skills than what they had before. So we can actually think about this process graphically. Imagine that this line represents all of the tasks available to labor in an economy through history. Now, what we've seen over time is that automation has displaced workers from some of these tasks redefining the nature of jobs available and the applicability of different skills. And this process has been ongoing. Now, of course, if this were the only form of technological progress, we would be confined to an ever shrinking pocket of tasks in an economy with presumably a smaller and a smaller participation of labor. But this is actually far from what we've seen historically. And I think that the reason has to do with the fact that at the same time as we've used technology to automate some tasks, we have also used technologies to create entirely new sectors, products, or jobs that require human inputs. So there are many examples of this phenomenon of new task creation and how it has played over time. For example, technologies like the personal computer have allowed a large fraction of workers to use their time as designers, coders, software engineers, and developers of digital content. And these are all jobs that didn't exist before. Thanks to smartphones with GPS and digital maps, millions of workers can now use their time productively by driving people and products around. And in fact, in our work, we estimate that around 40% of the increase in employment over the last 40 years took place precisely in these new tasks. There's also some work by David Autor and other colleagues, which documents that a sizable share of current employment is at jobs that didn't exist in the 1900s. So with these definitions in mind, I'm now going to think of two different regimes, which I'm going to argue characterize different historical episodes and are important for understanding current trends. So in the first regime, automation and new task creation are going to advance together and are going to balance each other out. So even though some tasks are getting automated, workers are also benefiting from the creation of these new labor intensive tasks. When the economy is in this regime, technological progress is going to change the nature of work, but human labor is going to retain a key role in the production process. And this is going to lead to constant labor shares, stable inequalities, rising wages for all, and actually healthy productivity growth as well. However, in a second regime, we might have that automation starts to outpace the creation of new tasks. 
And this could have potentially adverse distributional consequences, especially for the low skilled workers who are getting displaced by these advances in automation. So these two regimes provide a reasonable way of interpreting the historical record. For example, when we look at the US and between 1950s and 1985s, the labor share of national income remained roughly constant across all major economic sectors, as you can see from the left panel of the figure, which provides data for the US. Moreover, this was also a period when wages of different workers grew at very similar rates, suggesting that during this period, we indeed had a balancing of automation and new task creation that kept the participation of workers with different skills in production roughly unchanged. Now, this is very different from what we've seen since the early 80s, which is shown in the right panel. So in this more recent period, we see several signs of a shift in the balance of technology with automation playing a more prominent role. For example, we see from this figure that displacement has accelerated, at least when we measure it from the decline in the labor share, while fewer labor intensive industries are expanding and offsetting this displacement. In particular, what the figure shows is that the decline in labor's participation in production concentrates in sectors like manufacturing, where there's a lot of automation, and where the labor share of value added declined from 65% to 45% over the last 40 years. But also in other industries, such as retail and wholesale, where the labor share went down from 66% to 65%. And even though I'm not showing this here, this decline was almost exclusively driven by a lower labor share of production and non-supervisory workers. Now, these are gigantic changes, which suggest that the structure of production is becoming less reliant on labor, especially low-skilled labor in some of these industries. The evolution of wages across educational groups also provides an indication of a broken balance. So this figure, which I took from David Outer's Eli lecture, plots cumulative wage growth for men in the left panel and for women in the right panel. And workers of different educational groups or levels are represented by the lines of different colors. Now we can see that before the 80s, the period when displacement and new task creation balance each other out, we see all wages growing at a healthy and a similar rate. No workers were essentially being left behind during this period. But starting in the 80s, we see rising wages for men and for women with high levels of education at the same time as we have stagnant or even decreasing real wages for some workers with low levels of education, especially for men in the left panel. So this really suggests that there's a change in the balance of technology starting in the 80s that led to a deterioration of labor market opportunities and prospects for many US workers and favored mostly those with a college or a post-college degree. So let me take stock of what I've said so far. First, I've argued that we can think of history as being shaped by two forms of technological progress. On the one hand, we have automation, with its displacement effect, which displaces workers from more tasks. And on the other hand, we have the creation of new tasks, which actually has the power to reinstate labor as a key part of the production process. Second, I've argued that automation is not new, but historically it has been balanced by the creation of new tasks, which has led to balanced growth. And during most episodes in history, technology benefiting most groups of workers. Third, I've also argued that there are signs of a recent shift from this historical pattern with automation now starting to outpace the creation of new tasks, affecting some specific groups of workers, especially those with low levels of formal education. And so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is to dig deeper into some of the potential causes of this shift in the balance of technology and discuss some of the implications of this shift for inequality and for society, but also for Latin American countries. So on a fundamental level, one might imagine that this shift towards automation has been facilitated by the gigantic advances in computing power that we've had over the last four years. 
But I think that this explanation is fundamentally incomplete by itself because computers can and have also been used to augment or to create new tasks for workers and not just for automation. Instead, I think that a better way or a complementary way of thinking about the recent shift towards automation is as a response to demographic pressures and to institutional factors. Let me make the first point. Automation has become in many countries a necessity to deal with adverse demographic trends. In particular, when you look at industrial automation, it's being spearheaded by countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, and Italy. And these are all countries facing a rapid aging of their population. And this adverse trend is actually only expected to get worse in the future. And so from the perspective of these countries, developing automation technologies is necessary to deal with the scarcity of labor and the looming retirement of a large fraction of the workforce. This figure on the right, which comes from my research, shows that indeed those countries that have aged more rapidly in the last 30 years are precisely the ones that have made the biggest investments in industrial robots per worker as a whole. In my work with Daron, we've all actually inspected this relationship in more detail, and we also documented that aging countries are also developing and patenting more automation technologies and are starting to export these technologies to the rest of the world at a large scale. This data also makes an important point. It suggests that countries have very different incentives to adopt automation technologies and face different consequences from the adoption of these technologies. And so, for example, in rapidly aging countries such as Germany or Japan, reducing the participation of scarce labor in the production process is actually desirable and it's going to yield high productivity gains. The displacement effect is going to be minimal because there was a large number of workers who were close to retiring out of the labor force in any case. But instead, for countries like the US, who is not a leader in the development of automation technologies, but is in the middle of the pack, adopting these technologies that are not optimized to their demographic structure could have potential adverse consequences for workers. Indeed, from the US point of view, automation is not an endogenous response to scarce labor, but the adoption of automation technologies is actually driven by those exogenous developments abroad. And so it is in a way exogenously induced. induced. And so while in the US, the wages of displaced workers could fall due to these external technological advances, in other countries such as Germany, they won't because of the rising scarcity of workers that led to the development of these automation technologies in the first place. Now, this shift towards automation might also be a response to tax incentives. So, for example, in recent work with Daron and Andrea Manera, we computed effective tax rates on labor and on different types of capital for the US. These tax rates summarize the overcost that the tax system imposes on the use of each of these factors of production. In our work, we find that the tax on labor has remained constant at around 25%, whereas taxes on capital, and especially on software and equipment, have declined from around 15 to 20% to 5% in the last 25 years. And so one can imagine that this widening gap is going to generate incentives for automation, though we lack more direct studies on how persistent changes in the tax structure can affect the direction of technology and incentives for adopting automation technologies in the long run. Now, this is something that we've not studied in detail, but one might also speculate that changes in business mentality and a single-minded emphasis on automation by the research community might have played some role in explaining the shift towards automation. So for example, there are many questions that I think are interesting and understudied. Are there specific cultural norms among computer scientists or engineers that have favored the development of automation ahead of applications that complement and augment humans? 
are the success metrics used by AI researchers, where the objective in many cases is to explicitly replicate human proficiency at specific tasks, leading to too much emphasis on automation, while other more imaginative applications of AI and computer systems remain unexplored. Now, these are all speculative questions, but I think they're important, especially because in the future, there's gonna be many ways to develop AI and new technologies, which are currently at their infancy, and we should get a sense of in which direction these technologies are getting developed. So, so far, I provided some patterns that are consistent with a shift in the balance of technology towards more automation. And I've argued that this is driven in part by demographics and in part by taxes and other societal forces. But does the shift in the balance of technology actually matters? After all, many would argue that automation raises productivity. And if the displacement effects from automation are small, then automation is just going to increase the size of the pie and we are all going to benefit from it, even if some of us are confined to fewer tasks. Now, our research paints a less optimistic view. At least for the US, we find evidence consistent with the idea that automation brought small average gains in productivity at the same time as it created large negative costs concentrated in some groups of workers and regions. One way of thinking about it is as automation changed the distribution of the pie more than it increased the size of the pie. So for example, in our paper, Robots and Jobs, we explore the effects of the adoption of industrial robots across US commuting zones. And so in this work, we exploit the fact that advances in robotics actually concentrate in some very specific manufacturing sub-industries, and that advances in robotics are taking place abroad in Europe and Japan, as we saw before, and not in the US. And so to exploit this variation, we construct a measure of the exposure to robots for 722 commuting zones in the US, indexed by C in that formula. And this exposure is computed as a sum across all industries of two terms. The share of employment in each industry in that commuting zone, which captures the exposure of workers in that region to advances in technology in that industry. And second, the predicted robot adoption in that industry based entirely on advances in robotics among European countries. So our measure is gonna capture the fact that some commuting zones in the US are gonna be highly specialized in industries with the greatest advances in robotics in industries such as car manufacturing, chemicals, and the production of metal products. As you can see from the map in the right, workers in the industrial Midwest, but also in some parts of Ohio and Texas, are highly exposed to these advances in industrial robotics. Using this measure of exposure to robots, we find a reduction in both employment and wages, in the areas exposed to the greatest advances in robots between 1990 and 2007. The relationship for employment is shown in this figure, which plots changes in employment rates between 1990 and 2007 in the vertical axis against our measure of robot exposure on the horizontal axis. In particular, we find that each additional robot leads to three fewer jobs in manufacturing in these commuting zones and two, two fewer jobs in services, presumably because of demand spillovers as workers lose their labor income and then go on to reduce their consumption of local non-tradable goods. We also find adverse effects on wages with wages falling by 0.7% in relative terms in exposed commuting zones for every extra robot per thousand workers. Now, this exercise shows that the displacement effect of automation can create clear losers, in this case, regions, from technological progress. In more recent work, we've switched our attention from geography to study how automation is affecting specific groups of workers, and we've reached similar conclusions. So for example, in our recent paper called Tasks, Automation, and the Rise of US Wage Inequality, we quantify the effects that automation has had on the US wage structure over the last 40 years. 
In particular, we investigated this question using data for 500 groups of workers defined in terms of their gender, their experience, their race, their level of education, and whether they're immigrants or not. In the US, these groups specialize in very different industries and jobs within those industries for a variety of reasons, which implies that some of these workers have been more exposed to automation technologies than others. In fact, we can quantify the extent to which each of these groups have been subject to the displacement effects from automation by measuring the share of tasks that they lost to advanced technologies over the last 40 years, what we refer to as the task displacement experience by each of these groups of workers. We show in our work that we can measure this task displacement as the sum across industries of three terms for each of these groups. First, the share of wages earned by that group in each industry I, which is going to capture the extent to which that group of workers is exposed to that industry. Second, the revealed comparative advantage of that group in routine jobs within industry I. And this term is going to adjust for the fact that mostly routine tasks have been automated in recent years, and that therefore workers who specialize in those routine tasks are going to bear more of the incidence of automation. Finally, we have the percent decline in the industry labor share that is due to automation, and it provides the total amount of technological displacement that is taking place inside an industry. So this procedure yields a measure of task displacement that I'm plotting here on the figure in the right. Task displacement is plotted in the vertical axis for each of these 500 groups of workers, and their baseline wages in 1980 are shown in the horizontal axis so that we can get a sense of where in the wage distribution automation is hitting workers the most. Each marker is a group, and the sizes represent the population of that group, and the colors indicate the educational levels. So we see in this figure that workers without a college degree experience very high levels of task displacement, losing from 15 to 30% of their tasks to automation since the 1980s, while workers with a post-college degree experience essentially no displacement. We also see that task displacement concentrates in the middle of the wage distribution, which is going to implied that automation has both an unequalizing and a polarizing role. As expected from our theory, we find that since the 1980s, we've seen a sizable decline in the relative, but also in the real wages of these groups of workers that are highly exposed to task displacement, and that this has contributed to the observed increase in wage inequality. We estimate that a 10 percentage point increase in our measure of task displacement is associated with a 13 percent reduction in the relative wages of that group. Moreover, we show that this single measure of task displacement accounts for 50 to 70 percent of the observed changes in the wage structure over this period. All of the observed increase in the college premium and 75 percent of the increase in the past college premium we suggest that automation has been an important force in shaping the, way, the rise in wage inequality in the US. Now, this effect on inequality across regions and groups of workers wouldn't be so worrying if they were accompanied by large productivity and wage gains. However, the large increase in wage inequality observed in the US was actually accompanied by lackluster productivity growth and stagnant mean wages. So for example, since the 1980s, US total factor productivity increased only by 30% or equivalently by 0.8% per year. Instead, in previous years from 1950 to 1980, productivity growth was at a rate of 1.8% per year. So some refer to this observation as the productivity paradox and argue that the slowdown in productivity growth suggests that technology is really not at the root of the observed increases in inequality. Because if it were, well, then where are the productivity gains? But I think that this argument makes the mistake of equating all technological progress with automation to conclude that the slowdown in TFP implies that automation cannot be affecting labor markets. So let me offer a very different and perhaps more worrisome interpretation. 
Perhaps what we've seen simply reflects the fact that automation, and in particular, what we call so-so automation technologies, can actually bring very small productivity gains despite having large distributional effects. If this is the case, then total TFP growth and its dynamics are going to be explained by other forms of technological progress and are going to be decoupled from automation. So let's see how this works in detail. Automation involves the cost of producing existing goods. So as a result, the productivity gains from automation can be computed as the share of automated tasks in GDP times the percent reduction in cost from switching to produce these tasks with labor to producing them with capital. And this is a number that is going to be between zero and 100%. So for example, in the case of industrial robots, we've estimated that the percent reduction in cost from switching to industrial robots was of 30% per task that is being automated. So this implies that all of the automation required to generate the sharp reduction in manufacturing employment of close to 7 million jobs that we've had since the year 2000 would only increase TFP by around 2% in total, which is equivalent to a 0.1% growth rate in TFP per year over the last 20 years, a very small number. Let me give you another example. In our paper on tasks and inequality, we concluded that automation explains 50% of the observed changes in the wage structure. But at the same time, we estimate that automation only increased TFP by 4% since the 1980s. Again, this maps to a 0.1% increase in TFP per year, which is a very small number. And so in our work, we coined the term so-so automation technologies to refer to the automation of some tasks that displaces workers, but produces very small cost-saving gains and productivity gains. And in a way, these so-so technologies are going to be more problematic for society since we get all of the cost of rising inequality and displacement despite getting almost no productivity gains. So one can make sense of the productivity paradox just by postulating that a single-minded focus on automation has led us to develop too many so-so automation technologies. This explanation also implies that if we want to solve the productivity slowdown, we need more creative ways of developing technologies and that simply doubling down on automation is not a good way forward. So to conclude, let me briefly discuss some of the implications of this way of thinking about technology for developing countries. Most of my presentation today focused on the developed world. But there's an important question of how are these modern advances in automation going to affect developing countries? Now, there are several channels through which a shift towards more automation can affect Latin America, but also other developing countries more broadly. First, we can have that automation technologies are going to be inappropriate for the local structure of our countries, which actually face the exact opposite problem than Japan and Germany, and have to deal actually with growing populations and migration from rural to urban areas. And so in our country, the challenges is actually finding jobs for all of the people coming to cities. In the past, developing countries relied on the adoption of frontier manufacturing technologies as a strategy to generate large-scale formal employment and solve this problem. But this strategy seems less promising now that all of the frontier technologies are increasingly automated and have very low labor requirements. And this is a point that has also been emphasized recently by other people such as Danny Roderick. Now, a second channel is a slowdown of the so-called flying geese pattern, whereby industries fly from country to country in search for cheaper and abundant labor. So the way that this has worked before is that several industries move to developing countries in an effort to reduce their labor cost. And this benefits the host country, which over time starts to see rising wages, which then causes the industries to move on to the next country and so on. This pattern has, in my view, been a great equalizing force, causing wages to converge over time across many different countries. But one can also imagine that this pattern 
is going to slow down in a world where industry is becoming increasingly automated because this is going to reduce their incentives to search for low wage destinations now that they can rely on capital or automated machinery for production. The last two channels that I have here are also related to this. First, there's the idea that automation can foster reshoring. I'm a little bit skeptical of this since I believe that there are other cost advantages of keeping production abroad, such as cheap and abundant land for factories. But I do think that firms are going to retain their plants in developing countries, but these plants are going to become increasingly automated over time. And in the limit, what I think that we're going to see is vast amounts of foreign direct investment that essentially create little to no local employment because they're just setting up fully automated factories abroad. So that's all that I have for you today. Thanks so much for your attention. And I'm very happy to uh, answer some of the questions and reactions of the audience during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascual. This is all very interesting. I see uh, remarkable implications for developing countries and, and for Latin America in this regard. Uh, let me give the floor to Maria Savona for uh, her comments on your presentation. Maria, the floor is yours. Can you see the slides or can you hear me and see the slides? Yeah. Yes, can you make um, it bigger, put in the presentation format? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, okay, let me see. Can you see now? Yeah, yeah, there it goes. Okay, brilliant, great. So first of all, I would like to thank Carlo for the kind invitation and Pascual for the brilliant presentation. And for me, it's a privilege to be discussing the work of Pascual and Darona Semoglu. And, uh, and I'll try to uh, bring some of the stuff that we've been doing to see whether that we can you know, agree, converge, and have more results on, on the very relevant topic that Carlo has called us to discuss. Um, so, Basically, this is part of the work we are doing within an Horizon project called Pillars, Pathways to Inclusive Labor Markets, where we look um, more in depth into the uh, automation technology. So let me just, I'm, I'm gonna discuss mainly two points. Um, and this is in the hope that we will be building on each other work across the pond. So between um, what we're doing, what we, we have been doing as well in, in SPRU for several decades and what we're doing in, uh, in, uh, within this particular project, which builds a little bit on the tradition on the economics of technical change. So um, what we have been, and, and, and I identified two issues mainly. Um, first of all, to unpack the sort of uh, uh, current wave of automation that Pasquale so brilliantly put forward and identifying, so basically identifying in much greater granularity, this idea of exposure of sectors to um, what we call emerging digital technologies that it, it's basically a bit more articulated than automation. So to dig a little bit more in depth into what Pasquale has called the so-so um, technology. So ideally behind this, uh, we identify families of automation technologies and, and several issues related to the granularity of exposure to this. And the second point is really to uh, trying to draw a, a bit more, to dig a little bit more in that in terms of implication for Latin American countries, which in this case, uh, one of the issues that Pasquale has put forward is this tax system and, and the idea uh, of other labor distortion in, in, uh, for what concerns the use of labor. And what I will try to say is that there are some implications related to um, one of the final points that Pasquale was putting forward, this idea of uh, restructuring of uh, um, global value chains and the idea of participating in the global production networks that might particularly affect the role of Latin American countries in this. So I will focus on these two points and I'm looking forward to see um, more discussion later on. 
So what we've been doing in, in, uh, um, in pillars um, is basically, as I said, trying to see what is behind automation. So what are these emerging digital technologies that actually would not only replace or reinstate with new tasks, but also reconfiguring basically the sort of human machine interface. And uh, we have waves of technical change and, and, and regimes uh, of technical change widely identified um, uh, earlier on. I mean, we have mechanization in the 19th century, electrification in the 20th, and now um, various forms of digitization of production processes. And the idea would be to try to see whether this human machine interface has been changing over time within this later, latest um, uh, paradigm. And ideally, we need to identify what are the specific technical tasks within occupation, within sectors that are executed by humans and now executed by machines, but also what are the um, sort of reconfiguration at work behind the substituting or complementing of these tasks. So ideally, we call for um, this exposure con concept, which is very important, and, and Pasquale has been, um, and Daron have been working on this, but at a higher level of granularity to identify also the interdependency between the use of automation and, and human tasks. And ideally, uh, we prefer to use this idea of emerging capabilities for labor saving devices. So ideally, any adoption of technologies brings forward this idea that people learn how to use it. And then therefore, is not only the emerging of new tasks, but is also the idea of emerging capabilities to use these technologies. So ideally, what would be important for policy implication is also trying to see what we're doing within pillars, what type of educational training are more likely to feed into these emerging capabilities to make people, at, at, you know, um, to, to allow people to be at the same pace of, of various forms of automation. So ideally, what the main point that I'd like to put forward is that the idea of task redesigning rather than only substitute, substituting or com compensating tasks. And this is something that we would be able to analyze only when we unpack what is behind automation technologies. And within the work that we've been doing, we have identified several technology families that, that includes obviously robots, but also other types of, of digital automation technologies that have much to do with um, with these emerging capabilities and how human machine interfaces change, among which not only AI and robots, which is which are both on the hype of uh, of this literature, but also several other uh, technologies, for example, physical data acquisition, software based data management, and so on, that require tasks that might be um, related to uh, human creativity and so on. Um, additive manufacturing as well, but also uh, technologies that allow reconfiguring user interface or networking. And we basically trying to, um, within, a, within a sort of a multidisciplinary uh, perspective, as economists, we were trying to dig into the technical characteristics of these technologies and try to systematize, for example, the technical literature that has been working on different types of technologies to try to um, infer from the technical literature what exactly, what are the technical tasks that have been reconfigured, replaced, or, or reinstated. And this is just an example going back to, I don't know whether you can see that, but these are the tasks that are usually um, included in the ONET and, and based, I think, on uh, that Pasquale and, and Daron are also using. And the idea is trying to see, for example, um, the, the technological literature that explains the prototypes to be produced in the future and that, that will become automation technologies in the very near future, um, how, uh, what kind of tasks are being concentrated on. If you can see, for example, now, processing information and monitoring process material surroundings are, are those tasks that are 
mainly um, affected by the adoption of, of these technologies. And we can we can really identify, but only this is from, from a, a, a narrative literature review, what are the exposure then, then we, we plan to have a quantitative analysis as well. So basically biotechnology families, these are the tasks executing within work activities. And here we look, for example, at the degree of complementarities of technical tasks with human workers by technology families. So really the point here is trying to understand from the description of these technologies, what are the um, interaction with, with humans that these technologies require or will require in the very near future. So ideally, what we would like to do within this and what uh, where the, the, the areas in which we wish to uh, sort of complementing each other works is, is really the idea of, of unpacking the granularity of, of um, technology exposure and also the unpacking of the automation concept in different families of technologies. And we, in fact, identify a lot of heterogeneity that, uh, that it would be extremely important to account for when it comes to understanding what are the replacement of tasks, the reconfiguration of tasks, and, and actually the potential for emerging tasks within new occupation that are really, really related to the te technological capabilities that people can get. So ideally, um, if we work on, on automation technologies, the idea would be to be as granular as possible to understand um, more in general the future of work. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, and, and I'll be brief on this, is to me, and this is something that I've been working as well with, with colleagues in, uh, uh, in Lewis, is this idea of reshoring um, that Pasquale was putting forward that has enormous implication for Latin American countries. And ideally, again, we were trying to understand what's happening globally in terms of uh, um, regional versus global um, contribution to foreign value added in terms of uh, final output and where Latin American countries locate themselves within this global division of labor. We see new trends. We see new trends in terms of increasing of, of uh, regional um, value chains vis-a-vis -vis global value chains. And what I think is interesting, and I'll show this briefly, uh, this is part of an ongoing pro project with um, um, on, on near shoring and far sharing in different macro regions. What I would like to show is basically this um, idea that if we take into account North and Latin American countries. This is the only region vis-a-vis -vis European countries and Asia Pacific countries that actually import more value added from outside their own regions that, than from within. So I guess in line with what Pasquale was mentioning, what we really need to think about it is not only how people relate to technologies, but what is happening in terms of uh, restructuring of, of global value chains and where Latin American countries perform or locate within this, uh, with, within this context. So I'll, um, I'll stop here and I hope um, I raised two points where I would like to discuss with Pasquale a little bit more and, um, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, this is great. Uh, let me see whether there's any question from the audience. Um, perhaps somebody, this is a time to uh, write your questions on the chat function of YouTube and eventually ask uh, questions to our speakers. But perhaps if there's no question, let, let me start with a question for myself. Uh, we've been listening about uh, automation technologies and um, the, the effects of uh, uh, displacement uh, of, of different tasks. Uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the creation of new jobs and new tasks and so on. Uh, then we've been, we've been trying to think uh, how uh, this is going to influence uh, uh, developing countries in different regards. But my very first uh, direct question is, are these automation technologies going to be adopted at all in developing countries? Uh, uh, are, they, uh, are the capabilities to adopt and absorb these technologies 
available or is, is this going to be inevitable or somehow uh, these automation technologies will live out part of the world and then be mainly used in, in another part of the world? Maria, do you want to go first or should I go first? Please go ahead, Don Pascual, please. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so Carlo, thanks Thanks for the question. I think that that's an important question. The data suggests that the adoption of some technologies that we can at least measure remains low in developing countries. And so yeah. at least as far as today, we're not seeing a lot of adoption that I think has to do with what Maria was discussing and I hinted at also during my discussion that that is just that there's no problem of scarcity of labor in developing countries. And so there are less incentives to adopt these labor saving technologies. I think that going forward, most of the adoption in developing countries is gonna be done through multinational firms that are investing in those countries and not necessarily by local firms. And so the way that I think about it, and this is just a conjecture is, is again, like I was saying before, a foreign firm used to create a plant and generate local employment. Now that foreign firm is gonna put the same plant, let's say in Colombia, but that plant is gonna be fully automated. And so like in the data, it's gonna look as if Colombia adopted the automation technology, but it's really like not necessarily Colombia doing it. Uh, but the implication for Colombia is that, that these foreign direct investment, which in the past used to create some employment associated with it, no longer creates that employment associated with it. So it just it just shows up in the financial accounts, but it doesn't generate any jobs in Colombia. Thank you. Uh, Maria, any thoughts from you? No, well, this is this question is great. I mean, it's related to what I was trying to show earlier. I mean, the, 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 the usual trade-off is trade or technology, right? Either you adopt or, or, or you buy from outside. And I think beyond um, the usual issues about cost cutting, which is the main issue, whether you're trying to offshore, for example, or whether you automate, um, I think I think we should be worrying about the amount of learning that these two um, options allow. <laughs> so ideally, um, in general, what I would think is important to look at is whether there is any positive side of adoption technologies that might allow some forms of learning for which we can hope that new jobs are able to be created that can interact with technologies a little bit more. And also what happened in terms of international competitiveness. So ideally where Latin American countries, um, as, I, as I was trying to put forward, are located within um, global production network. Carlo, you've been working on that for 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 such a long time that that I think there's nothing to add to what to your work. But I think it's important also to look at what the new trends are uh, in terms of nearshoring, in terms of reshoring, and in terms of how this is sustainable in the long term uh, from a macro perspective. It then is uh, able to um, create more demand for labor. So it is a complex question. And, and, uh, and I think we should be looking at both sides of the story, technology and trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no other question, let me see. Uh, this, I see this, there's a question from Mercedes Menendez from the UNESCO chair, your new merit. Um, She's, she's wondering uh, what are the human capital challenges for Latin American countries to be able to insert successfully in a new di digitalization wave? What are the required skills? This is something I was thinking about I mean, in terms of the policy implications of, of, of your research. Uh, should, should countries uh, reform their education uh, and training systems uh, in order to uh, uh, help develop uh, uh, these these capabilities and absorb and and adopt these different technologies. Should they rather follow the uh, the the appropriate technology in that that should be adopted in the countries that is uh, uh, given the labor abundance relative to capital? Then let's use uh, more labor intensive technologies and not so much automation, and therefore find your own way of of, of developing without necessarily adopting uh, advanced technologies of this kind or, 
or, or but let's perhaps let's focus on the education and training and and, and human capital. What what do you think uh, would be the possible policy options in this regard? Maria, you should take this one first. <laughs> <laughs> Symmetry, Pasquale, you're right. Um, let me, uh, this is again, I mean, it's, it's a hugely relevant policy question. Um, let me just, I have colleagues and partners within Pillars that have been working on that. And what they've been found, they've been very recently published, um, uh, you know, they find that what makes the difference is the early career skills. So what you actually are able to um, provide in at the very beginning of the education pathways in terms of soft skills and, and other forms of, uh, um, how can we call it, ways to increase your the flexibility you have to interact with technologies. And the early skills seems to be much more important than what you get at the end of the career, apparently, in terms of um, uh, in terms of your wage um, uh, upgrading perspectives. And this is something extremely interesting. And also, um, I would add that complementing these early skills in the educational system with some forms of vocational training within the firms is extremely useful. This is something that we have been uh, finding as well within um, a report on, on um, for the European Commission. This is something that is extremely important to support because the idea is also to um, create a mutual benefit for, between firms and workers. So if, if you keep uh, relying on this initial um, early skills and, and uh, increase flexibilities to um, adopt the technologies for incumbent workers, this is extremely important. Um, I don't know whether Pasquale have some different views or additional views. No, I agree. I agree completely with er everything that, that Maria just said. Like, let me just add some remarks, but this is mostly related to what Carlo was hinting at at the end of the question, which is the idea of, okay, should we train engineers or software developers in order in order to be able to adopt these technologies? Or should we just kind of like invest in science and let our country start developing its own appropriate technologies? And I think that for this way of posing the question, I think that there's an argument to be made for developing countries to start investing more in science and more in researching and developing their own technologies that are optimized for their population structure and for their own problems. Because I think that essentially what developing countries are doing right now is that we are the direction of technology is being chosen in Japan and Germany, and we're just borrowing from that. And so, and so that's always going to be a limit to how much those technologies can help a country solve its own problems. And so I think that, of course, like if you can adopt those technologies now that they've been invented, that's great. But you should also try to invest a little bit in trying to solve your own problems with your local knowledge and so on. And that's also part of my message, I think. I think that, that this strategy of, oh, let's just copy everything that gets invented abroad, that strategy perhaps is going to prove less profitable in the years to come. And so we need to think about a strategy where developing countries start creating their own technologies and their own ways of increasing productivity. Very if I may, can yes. I react a little bit to this? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's, it's great, Pasquale. I mean, this is something that has been obsessing, you know, economists <laughs> of, of technical change and development for quite a while. Ideally, if you develop your own technology, I don't know what you mean by adapted to local structure. Uh, I guess different technologies or, or technologies adopted to the, the you know the, the specific specialization that yeah, developing countries have. Absolutely not. Just just to clarify that point. So let's imagine that you have agriculture, right? And so, like in agriculture, mm -hmm. we have abundance of land. So we don't really need technologies that save on land. We need technologies that use actually land more intensively. So that's just one example from, from agriculture, whereas the technologies 
the agricultural technologies that are being developed abroad are mostly like of the land saving type. And so they're so, not very yes. helpful for, for our countries. So that's just one example for agriculture. But I think for manufacturing, you could also make another case. Like we have a lot of workers that could be employed in manufacturing and they're very good. So perhaps we need to develop better tools uh, for them to use uh, instead of just, just buying robots to replace those workers. So I, I know, I mean, it's hard to come up with concrete examples, but but those are some of the ideas that I that I have in mind. It's just about how the technology uses the factors of production that you are currently abundant on. And you want technologies so, that, yes. that use more intensively those factors of production that you have in abundance. It makes perfect sense. I guess I guess one has to trade off a little bit with um, the idea that that then if um, if trade competitiveness or or you know or positioning in favorably in global value chains is an issue, then we we need to uh, balance out the two policy objectives. So ideally, we probably need to account for for where where it is the frontier and where you want to go in terms of direction of uh, of um, of technologies so but i guess um i guess this is, is it remains a complex issue so maybe carlo has some solutions to that <laughs> yeah i have solution for everything no no just kidding but uh, i see another question that, that is coming from the floor it's actually tomaso charlie from you and you married uh, he's asking a few things, but essentially, I mean, the, he concludes with uh, uh, a question for, for mainly for Pasquale, uh, whether he's implying that industrial policies uh, should redefine comparative advantages. Uh, I mean, I see behind uh, Pasquale's uh, last comment and the direction of technological change, uh, a very large role for policies directing and influencing and orienting uh, efforts in, in in this regard. So, yeah. So let me can... let me take that let me take that question because I think that that it's very interesting. But actually, what I'm proposing is not so much about redefining the comparative advantage of a country, but about deepening the comparative advantage of a country. This is the best way of thinking about it. If you start adopting technologies from abroad that are optimized to their local mix of inputs, then you're essentially moving against your comparative advantage because you're adopting technologies that are getting you closer in terms of input utilization to what other countries abroad are doing. So if you wanna deepen your comparative advantage, you wanna do the opposite. You wanna develop technologies that are quite unique to your local mix of inputs. And so, yes, there's a role of policy, the role of policy is not, we should go against our comparative advantage. The point is actually the opposite. We should deepen our comparative advantage by developing more technologies that are suited for the types of inputs that we have in abundance. So that's, that's I guess, also related to, to the point that, that Maria raised at the end. And, and that would be my, my answer to, to that question, which I, which I think it's, it's a great question, but yeah. Local technology development actually deepens your comparative advantage. It doesn't change it. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I do agree. Uh, can I try to conclude with one question that is not uh, central in what you've been uh, telling us about, but that is behind our and, and within our heads and, and behind the, and it, it is something that is concerning us all the time, that is sustainability. I mean, there's a lot of uh, literature coming up and discussing this this twin transition where the digital goes together with green and and sustainability and and we've been hearing a lot about uh, automation technology but we we didn't hear anything about green and sustainability um do you have a comment on that Pasquale, you start now <laughs> yeah actually like i have i have no comment other than agreeing that that seems extremely important. I, I mean, I worked a lot on automation and I never thought of that. So yeah, yeah, that that seems interesting to think of whether automation can increase the efficiency with which we use materials, for example, or yeah. can reduce energy consumption. And and to be honest, like I, as far as I know, I haven't seen a lot of papers or research on this topic, but it seems 
important and it's something that yeah i i, I don't know much about but I, but i agree it's interesting yeah no, this, this is part of the frontier i was trying i was trying to say i mean it's true that partly part of this technological upgrading would be in the green and again i, I probably would revert to the work of many brilliant colleagues in SPRU that are working on that and SPRU and everywhere that are, look, that are looking at twin transitions and how um, brown jobs can become green jobs thanks to um, technical change. But as I said, I'm, I'm not quite an expert in, in green and I prefer to read what other people, <laughs> what other people write about this. Maybe someone from the floor has some views on this. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's people interested and people very knowledgeable about this, uh, but I think we have, we have to conclude here. Uh, let me thank you very much for this very, very stimulating and, and interesting um, presentation and discussion. I mean, it's been great. I've been learning a lot. Um, we're going to have another uh, webinar uh, in April, on uh, April 25th, uh, where we're going to have... Uh, um, Andres Velasco coming over uh, in Maastricht and discussing. Um, Andres is now um, uh, directing the School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics, in addition to having been a, a Minister of Finance in, in his own country, Chile. So we, we will be able to discuss a lot of the policy implications of, uh, of science, technology, uh, uh, developments and sustainability, I'm sure. And uh, in the meanwhile, thank you very much, Pascual. Thank you very much, Maria. I'm sure that the audience enjoyed very much uh, your talk. Thank you and, and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Carlo. Thanks, thank Maria. Thanks a lot, Carlo.